<laughs> okay, so uh, welcome and thank you all for coming uh, to this so very special occasion and so this very important activity of our honors program. In a minute I will thank the couple of people who are responsible for putting this together and making possible the presence of Dr. Plantinga here. Just to remind you, this is not the last, strange as it might sound, this is not the last activity of the day of the honors program. There is Today is honors night at the Yeshiva College Dramatic Society production of the mouse that roared, so I am going with a group of 20 people and you are welcome to join us if you are still the stamina after this lecture. Uh, but this is a very important occasion because thanks to the uh, big effort of Professor Aaron Siegel, we managed to secure the presence on this campus and in this talk of Dr. Plantinga. Uh, and I want to thank particularly Professor Siegel for putting this together. I want to acknowledge the collaboration of the Strauss Center, who made also possible part of the visit of uh, Dr. Plantinga, and everybody who worked to organize this. So thank you and welcome. So to introduce properly Dr. Plantinga, because that's too much for me to do, I, we don't have a Dr. Plantinga in the faculty with us, but we have probably the next best thing, to have one of his great students here who recently joined our faculty, Professor Siegel, and who's uh, teaching already very actively in the honors program, and we are very glad that he will be the one introducing Dr. Plantinga. Is that correct, Aaron? That is correct, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Thank you. For that introduction to the introduction. Uh, so on behalf of the Yeshiva College Honors Program, uh, the Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought, and the Yeshiva College Philosophy Department, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, this e to this evening's lecture entitled, uh, Science and Religion, Where Does the Conflict Lie? Uh, our lecturer this evening, uh, as um, I hope you're all aware, uh, is Alvin Planiga, uh, the John A. O'Brien Professor of Philosophy Emeritus at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, over the last five decades, Planiga, uh, or Al, as he's officially known by students and colleagues, has made uh, seminal contributions to the fields of metaphysics, epistemology, uh, and philosophy of religion. He is widely credited with the revival of philosophy of religion in that period, and is seen by many philosophical friends and foes alike as having restored the philosophical respectability of religious belief. To use a Hebrew term that is perhaps uh, too often applied by us observant Jews, but which is undoubtedly apt uh, in this instance, uh, Alvin Plantinga is a gadol, uh, a towering figure in the field of philosophy and a giant of a human being. It is thus a tremendous honor for us at Yeshiva to host him this evening. On a more personal note, it is a great pleasure to have Al here, as I was privileged to have him uh, as a philosophical mentor and dissertation advisor at Notre Dame, and it's always a delight uh, to see him. So thank you, Al, uh, for coming. Without further ado, Alvin Planiga. Uh, thanks very much, Aaron. Aaron um, says he was a student of mine at, uh, at Notre Dame, which is true. Uh, if, I told you, if I told you how good a student he was, uh, he'd be very embarrassed, so I won't say any more about that. Uh, also, I'd like to note that I'm giving this lecture, um, I've given this lecture several times before, and as a matter of fact, there is someone here who is now hearing it for the fourth time. So I don't know what that means. Does this mean it? <laughs> it could mean that, it's, uh, that this lecture is so obscure it takes many times to follow it. <laughs> Or it could mean that it's, you know, it's like a wonderful musical composition. You want to hear it sort of like Mozart's 25th Piano Concerto. You want to hear it over and over again. In any event, the, the talk is about science and religion. My title is Science and Religion, Where the Conflict Really Lies. I want to argue that there is a kind of science and religion conflict, but it's not where people ordinarily take it to be. So if you, uh, if you think about alleged areas of conflict between science and religion. There are several. I mean, for example, uh, some people think that um, 
the idea of miracles endorsed by many religious people, Christians, Jews, others, that this idea is contrary to science. Science discovers laws, and now a miracle would be a violation of a law. So there's a conflict there between science and, and miracles. Um, people also think there is such a thing as a scientific worldview, which is thought somehow to exclude God, uh, to, to, um, to, to really lean strongly in the direction of naturalism. There's also scientific biblical scholarship um, which comes in several different forms and sometimes comes to, comes to the conclusion conclusions entirely different from those that are accepted by the faithful. So there are these different areas, but I want to talk about just one area, um, alleged conflict between uh, Christian belief or, and um, belief in God, say theistic belief, and evolution. That's what I want to talk about. So if you look here in the handout, I'll argue that one, contemporary evolutionary, evolutionary theory is not incompatible with theistic belief. And I'll argue two, that the main anti-theistic arguments involving evolution together with other premises also fail. I mean, somebody might hold that evolutionary theory just in itself is incompatible with theistic belief, belief in God. Someone else might hold, well, that's not quite true, but um, evolutionary theory, together with some other sort of obvious truths of one kind or another, or very plausible truths, those are incompatible with uh, theistic belief. I want to argue that that's not true. And finally, I want to argue that naturalism, I take naturalism to be the idea, I mean, you can define the term however you like. Um, it's not that there is some one definition that everybody ought to accept. But I use the term to mean that there is no such person as God, the God of theism, the God of the theistic religions, no such person as God or anything like God. So naturalism is stronger than atheism. It entails atheism, but isn't entailed by it. Um, Hegel, for example, uh, might be plausibly thought to be an atheist, but not a naturalist. So you can be uh, an atheist but not rise to the full heights or sink to the complete depths, whichever way you want to put it, of naturalism. Um, but you can't be a naturalist without being an atheist, all right? So here's naturalism, I say, as I say here, the thought that there's no such thing as the God of theistic religion or anything like God. That's an essential element in the naturalistic worldview. And the naturalistic worldview, while it's not itself a religion, is, you might say, a sort of quasi-religion or hemi-religion or demi-religion or something like that. It's sort of like a religion, even though it's not a religion itself, or is plausibly thought not to be. It's like a religion in that it answers some really deep, essential questions, like um, where do human beings come from? Um, do they have any prospects for life after death? What's most real in the world? What's basically real about the world? And so on. So what I want to argue finally then, in the third place, is that naturalism is incompatible with evolution. Not in the sense that they can't both be true, but in the sense that you can't sensibly believe them both. That's what I want to argue, all right? I want to argue that naturalism and um, evolution are in, <coughs> are in conflict. So I'm, I want to say there is a science slash religion or science slash quasi religion conflict, all right? But it's a conflict between naturalism and science, not between theistic religion and science. I'm warming to the occasion. So first, contemporary evolutionary theory is incompatible with, is compatible with theistic belief. Uh, first, note that evolution covers a variety of theses. Um, the New Testament says love covers a variety of, what is it, Eddie? Love covers a variety of, Sin. no, of sins. <laughs> but any of it, I'm saying here, evolution covers a variety of theses. There are several different theses that, are, that come under this rubric. First, the ancient earth thesis, the idea that the earth is uh, very old, enormously older than, say, 6,000 years or 10,000 years, maybe 4 billion years old. So the ancient earth thesis. 
second the thesis of descent with modification. So um, the uh, so the source, the origin of the enormous variety we find in the living world now. Um, that a variety uh, that variety arises by virtue of offspring differing ordinarily in relatively small ways from their parents, and these differences accumulate over the generations, and as a result, you get this enormous variety of life that we do see. Um, the common ancestry thesis, which is the idea that if you pick any two living creatures and trace their ancestries back far enough, you'll find a common ancestor, right? So not only for all the people in the world, but also for uh, people and plants, say for people and poison ivy. That may be easier to imagine in the case of some people than of others. But the idea is if you take a human being and a particular bit of poison ivy and trace their ancestry back, eventually you hit a common ancestor. All right. And then uh, finally, for Darwinism, which I'm naming Darwinism because Darwin has himself asserted something like that, that's the claim that the principal, not only, but principal mechanism driving this process of, de of descent with modification is natural selection winnowing some source of uh, genetic variation where people frequently talk about random genetic mutations. So the idea again is that <coughs> maybe a mutation occurs to a, a certain creature. Most such mutations would be um, either neutral or lethal, but some are um, some provide a small advantage, a small uh, increment of fitness for the creature in question. And if this uh, mutation is also heritable, um, then it can spread to the whole population, um, and then the whole process can start over again. And by virtue of that process going on over and over again um, in many different directions at the same time, by virtue of that process, you get all the all the diversity of our living world. Okay. Now I want to ask the question whether contemporary evolutionary theory is compatible with theistic belief belief in God. Um, so, the, so with respect to the first three of those, there seems to be no particular question. Um, God could certainly have created the world in such a way that he created the earth a very long time ago. Um, it could be that he also created living beings, human beings and others by virtue of descent with modification and also uh, by virtue of a process involving common ancestry. But what about Darwinism? Is Darwinism incompatible with theistic religion? Um, well, several people seem to think so. The dreaded four horsemen of atheism do, for example, Richard Dawkins and, da and uh, Daniel Dennett and Hitchens and, uh, and Harris. They all not only claim, they shout that uh, belief in God is incompatible with evolution. And when I speak of theistic religion, I mean basically Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And when I speak of Christianity, I'm thinking of what C.S. Lewis calls mere Christianity. That is... Uh, something like the intersection of the great Christian creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Catholic Baltimore Catechism, and so on. Take what's more or less common to them all, their intersection. That would be mere Christianity. Um, and what I've been saying so far then is that the first three of these are compatible um, with theistic religion, with Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And I'm asking about the fourth, Darwinism, and saying first that there are these people who insist that it isn't. Well, um, why do they think that? They think that because it's part of uh, Christian belief and um, at least some kinds of Jewish belief that God has created human beings in his image. God has created human beings in his image. And that implies that God had a certain idea in mind and then acted um, in such a way as to bring it about that that, uh, that idea should be realized. Uh, that implies that human beings, that God intended that there be human beings, of, that there be beings of a certain sort, <coughs> namely human beings. He intended and planned that. Uh, but many people claim that um, the whole process of evolution means that human beings and other creatures are not intended or planned, that they happen, they just happen. It just happens that it turns out this way. It could have turned out very differently. So, for example, 
Stephen Gould says something like this, that if the evolutionary tape were to be rewound and let go forward again, you'd probably get something completely different from what we have now. You probably wouldn't get anything like Homo sapiens, all right? But I'm not sure why that should be, why we should think that's true. Uh, why couldn't God have used this process? I don't say that God did use this process to create the world, the living world, but why couldn't he have, uh, for example, caused the right mutations to arise at the right time? Why couldn't he have uh, protected certain populations from extinction and the like? I, as I say, I'm not saying that God did do things that way, but I can't see that there's any incompatibility there between that suggestion and theistic religion. What's not consistent with Christian belief or theistic belief is the claim that evolution and Darwinism are unguided, unguided by God or anyone else, where I take that to be to include being unplanned and unintended. That's not compatible with Christian belief or with belief in God. The idea that evolution and Darwinism, this whole process is unguided, just happens. But there are, uh, there's a whole choir of distinguished experts who assert exactly that. So, for example, George Gaylord Simpson says, man, and no doubt woman as well, I added the, and no doubt woman as well, um, is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. I suppose in principle, somebody, I don't know, could it, in principle, so somebody say, well, man is the result of such a purposeless process, but not woman? I don't know. Think it over. <laughs> And then uh, there's Stephen Jay Gould, I mentioned a moment ago, if the evolutionary tape were to be rewound and then let go forward again, the chances are we'd get creatures of a very different sort. Um, then there's Dawkins in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, which I recommend you. I think it's a very good book. Um, I completely disagree with it, but it seems to me there's a, there's a lot of really interesting stuff in it. It's a worthwhile book. He says this, all appearances to the contrary, the only watchmaker in nature is the blind forces of physics, albeit displayed in a very special way. A true watchmaker has foresight. He designs his cogs and springs and plans their interconnections with a future purpose in his mind's eye. Natural selection, the blind, unconscious, automatic process which Darwin discovered and which we now know um, in, these, in this sort of context, you often get this, this expression, which we now know, and which we now know is the explanation for the existence and apparently purposeful form of all life, has no purpose in mind. It has no mind and no mind's eye. It has no, it does not plan for the future. It has no vision, no foresight, no sight at all. If it can be said to play the role of watchmaker in nature, it is the blind watchmaker. <clears throat> and the subtitle of his book, of this book is, Why the Evidence of Evolution Reveals a Universe Without Design. Or maybe he could have said, How the Evidence of Evolution Reveals a Universe Without Design. So he's uh, very enthusiastic about the claim that evolution somehow reveals a universe without design, shows that the universe is not designed. Well, um, why does Dawkins think natural selection is blind and unguided? Um, why does he think that the evidence of evolution, as he says, reveals a universe without design? Well now, Dawkins does three things in this book. Um, First, he recounts some of the fascinating anatomical details of certain living creatures and their ways. So he talks, for example, about bats, and what he says about them is very interesting. He's, he uh, explains how bats can fly through a completely dark cave with uh, stalactites coming down from the top and stalagmites coming up from the bottom and not very much space between them. Bats can fly through such a cave at a very high rate of speed without so much as brushing any of these uh, stalactites or stalagmites or other obstacles. Um, they have a kind of sonar that enables them to navigate in that fashion. 
and he discusses, he talks about several other um, adaptations of other animals which are similarly interesting. So that's one thing he does, and that part of the book is really good. And then second, he tries to refute arguments for the conclusion that blind, unguided evolution could not have produced certain of the wonders of the living world. So, for example, going all the way back to Darwin's time, there were people who would propose one or another kind of, um, of, kind of um, organ or something of the sort, the eye, for example, and say, well, now this just couldn't have been produced by unguided evolution, it's too complicated and various parts have to, have to be modified together and the like and it just couldn't happen. Well, he tries to re re refute some of those arguments. And then third, um, he makes suggestions as to how these and other organic systems could have developed by unguided evolution. So that's basically what he does in this book. The form of the main argument for his conclusion that the evidence of evolution reveals a universe without design, the form of that main argument, as far as I can make out, goes like, uh, as you see there uh, on the sheet, the premise for this argument is, we know of no irrefutable objections to its being biologically possible that all of life has come to be by way of unguided Darwinian processes. That's the premise. The conclusion of the argument, so this is an argument that's got just one premise, is, therefore, all of life has come to be by way of unguided Darwinian processes. All right? So the argument form is uh, of the form, nobody's proved it impossible, therefore it happened. Um, I don't know whether at Yeshiva that kind of argument is highly regarded, or whether uh, in logic classes um, it's scoffed at. Um, philosophers sometimes give unsound arguments, um, but and I've given some myself, I'm sorry to say, I admit, shamefacedly. But, uh, but they hardly ever give arguments where the distance between premise and conclusion is as great as that. It's possible, nobody's proved it's impossible that P, therefore P. Imagine uh, I call, come home and tell my wife, President Obama has struck a new medal for philosophy, for excellence in philosophy, and I'm to be the first recipient. Oh, she says, why do you think that? Nobody's proved it impossible. <laughs> well, um, I think the discussion from that point on might not be totally pleasant. So I take it that's a really lousy argument. I would say Dawkins utterly fails to show that the facts of evolution reveal a universe without design. He doesn't show this at all, he just asserts it. Still, the fact that he and others assert his subtitle loudly and slowly, as it were, uh, imagine, you know, you're talking to a sort of inattentive eight-year-old whom you want to do something or other, and this eight-year-old doesn't really pay any attention to you. You hold the eight-year-old by the shoulders and talk loudly and try to get them, try to get the eight-year-old to do what you want it to do. So the fact that he and others assert his subtitle loudly and slowly, as it were, can be expected to convince many that the biological theory of evolution is, in fact, incompatible with the theistic belief that the living world has been designed. Well, you might say, what about um, the fact that the relevant genetic mutations are said to be random? So it's random genetic mutations which is worked on by um, natural selection. What about this random? Well, random here doesn't imply random as it's used in this context. I mean, the word random is used very differently in different contexts. There are random numbers, for example. Um, what random here doesn't imply anything like being uncaused. Rather, um, the term means it's random with respect to the adaptational needs of the organisms in question. So here's what Ernst Mayer says, when it, and he's one of the uh, outstanding evolutionary <coughs> biologists of the last century. When it's said that mutation or variation is random, the statement simply means that there is no correlation between the production of new genotypes and the adaptational needs of an organism in a given environment. No correlation between uh, the new genotypes and the needs of the organism in an environment. Elliot Sober, 
uh, perhaps the outstanding philosopher of science, or at least of biology nowadays, says this, um, and Eliot Sober is no believer. He says, there is no physical mechanism, either inside organisms or outside of them, that detects which mutations would be beneficial and causes those mutations to occur. So his point is that a mutation accruing to an organism is random, just if neither the organism nor its environment contains a, mecha a mechanism or process or organ that causes adaptive mutations to occur. But surely a mutation could be both random in that sense and also intended and indeed caused by God. So, um, so the point here then just is that when it's said that these mutations are random, that's not incompatible with their being caused and orchestrated by God. Um, so the claim that evolution demonstrates that human beings and other living creatures have not, contrary to appearances, been designed, that's not a part of or a consequence of the scientific theory of evolution as such at all. It's more like a metaphysical or theological add-on. People who make this claim confuse the scientific theory of evolution with a sort of naturalistic, uh, naturalistic gloss on the theory. So when they make this assertion, um, it's not what they're saying is not accurate to the theory of evolution. Rather, they've got the theory of evolution, and then they add something, a metaphysical or theological add-on. As polls reveal, most Americans have grave doubts about the truth of evolution. I've forgotten just what the figures are, but um, does anybody happen to know? It's a pretty large number. A large proportion of Americans don't believe in the theory of evolution. They reject it. Many Christians, for example, are concerned about the teaching of evolution in the schools, the public schools, and they want to add something as a corrective. For example, intelligent design, ID, intelligent design, or they want evolution to be taught as a mere theory rather than as the sober truth or they want it to be taught along with objections to it, or they want um, the controversy, they say, teach the controversy, and so on. Now, why should this be the case? Why is it that uh, so many Americans don't accept the theory of evolution? Well, we're regularly told by uh, the experts, Dawkins and Dennett, Gould, Ayala, and others, that current scientific theory asserts or implies that the living world is not designed. That's what these experts tell us and that the evolutionary process is unguided. For example, the National Association of Biology Teachers until 10 years ago officially described evolution on their website as an unsupervised, impersonal, unpredictable, natural process. And if we're regularly told by the experts that in fact the theory is a theory of unguided evolution, then it's no wonder that many Christians believe that. Furthermore, if they do believe it, it's no wonder that they don't want it taught as a sober truth in the public schools. Thus understood, it is incompatible with Christian and Jewish and Muslim belief. Clearly, there are questions of justice here. Would it be just to teach in public schools <coughs> positions that go contrary to the religious belief of most of those who pay for those schools? Okay. I'm going to skip the second part, broader anti-theistic arguments, and go on to the third part. Third part, naturalism versus evolution. Once more, um, nat uh, I'm taking naturalism to be the view that there's no such person as God or anything like God. Um, the young Hegel might be an example, or the old Hegel too, of a naturalist who, of an atheist who's not a naturalist. Um, it might be that uh, dualism about human beings, the idea that a human being a la Augustine, a la Descartes, is essentially an immaterial substance joined to a certain uh, material substance, physical substance, namely a body. Maybe that's precluded by naturalism. The way I've defined it, it's a little bit vague. The main point is that, it's a, that, it's, um, that it implies atheism and is a bit stronger. 
Okay, so I'm going to use the letter N to be an abbreviation for naturalism. Um, and I will use the letter E as abbreviation for the idea, the proposition that uh, we have come to be by virtue of the processes mentioned in current evolutionary theory. So N, naturalism, E, evolu evolution. And then I want to use R as the proposition that our cognitive faculties are reliable. When I speak of cognitive faculties, I mean such things as uh, memory and perception, a priori insight, those would be cognitive faculties. Maybe there's also a special faculty whereby we can tell what other people are thinking or feeling on a given occasion. Um, there's also induction, whereby we can learn about the future <coughs> from the past. These would be cognitive faculties. To say that they are reliable would be to say that they, what they furnish us with is for the most part true, <coughs> most part true beliefs. Uh, it doesn't have to be 100% true beliefs, but some sizable proportion. I don't know just what it would be. At least two out of three, at least three out of four, <coughs> maybe four out of five. You pick your own, all right? So that's um, how I'm using, so I'm taking N as an abbreviation for naturalism, or naturalism is true. E as an uh, abbreviation for the idea that we've come to be by virtue of current evolutionary theory, the processes mentioned there. And R is the proposition that our cognitive faculties are reliable. This argument has four premises and one conclusion. So the first premise, uh, the probability of R on N and E is low. Here I'm talking about conditional probability, the probability of one proposition conditional on the truth of some other or given some other proposition. So for example, uh, the probability that uh, Jock is a Mormon, given that Jock lives in Glasgow, Scotland, that's pretty low. Not very many Mormons in, in uh, in, in Glasgow. The proposition that Brigham is a Mormon, given that Brigham lives in Salt Lake City, that's going to be much higher, higher proportion of Mormons in Salt Lake City certainly than in Glasgow, all right? So you get the idea, conditional probability, the probability of one proposition given some other one. Uh, then the first premise is the probability of our cognitive faculties being reliable given naturalism and evolution is low. That's the first premise, all right? The second premise is one who accepts naturalism and evolution and also sees that the first premise is true as a defeater for R, the belief that our cognitive faculties are reliable. A defeater. Um, the idea of a defeater is something like this. A defeater is some belief you acquire, a defeater of a given belief P that you've got is some other belief Q you acquire such that as long as you believe Q you can't rationally also believe P, all right? So for example, um, this is an example that comes from the famous philosopher Roderick Chisholm. You look into a field, uh, you see what you take to be a sheep in the distance and you form the belief there's a sheep in this field. Then along comes uh, the owner of the field whom you know to be a reliable person and this person tells you that he doesn't have any sheep in his field but he does have a dog that from that distance looks like a sheep. Well then you've got a defeater for your original belief that there was a sheep there. All right. Um, defeaters can themselves be defeated. You can have defeater defeaters. So as an example, um, continuing with the first story, uh, you go, I don't know, you go have lunch with, uh, with this man who, says, who uh, is the owner of the field. And when he's out of the room, his wife comes up to you with a sad look on her face and says that while he's doing fine, cognitively speaking, on all topics, there's one where he really has a problem. He always claims there are no sheep in that field, even when there are. Well, then you've got a defeater for your original defeater. Call it a defeater defeater. You can also have defeater, defeater, defeaters. I won't bother to illustrate that. Or defeater, 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 defeaters, and so on. I mean, I imagine this could go as far as you like. But we'll only go to the second level there, defeater, defeaters. 
So three says then this defeater can't be defeated. This defeater for R that you get if you believe in any can't itself be defeated. Um, and then four says if you have a defeater for R for the proposition that your faculties, cognitive faculties are reliable, then you have a defeater for any belief you take to be produced by your cognitive faculties, including N and E. If you have a defeater for, say, the proposition that your thermometer is reliable, then you will have a defeater for any belief um, that's formed on the basis of what that thermometer says, right? In the same way here, if you have a defeater for, um, for R, you've got a defeater for any belief you take to be produced by your cognitive faculties, which of course is all of your beliefs, and uh, also including then N and E. Therefore, N and E is self-defeating and can't rationally be accepted. Not arguing that N and E, that conjunction is false, but only that you can't rationally accept it. It's not rationally, that conjunction isn't rationally acceptable. Now, you might like to argue about any of these premises, but in particular, maybe you'd like to argue about the first premise. So, and what I'll say next here, I want to give an argument for the first premise. I want to take naturalism to include materialism or physicalism about human beings. Most naturalists, as far as I know, I don't know of any naturalist who isn't a materialist or a physicalist about human beings. I want to take naturalism to include materialism or physicalism, that is to include the idea that human beings are um, material objects through and through. It's not the case that a human being has as a part an immaterial self or soul or ego. It's not the case that a human being, a la Augustine and Descartes, just is an immaterial self or soul or ego joined to a certain um, body. That's not the case. Rather, a human being is just a material object through and through. All right? Take that to be materialism. Now, from the point of view of materialism, what sort of thing would a belief be? Assuming that there are such things as beliefs, maybe the belief that 7 plus 5 equals 12, uh, maybe the belief that uh, naturalism is all the rage these days. Um, what sort of thing would a belief have to be? Well, I guess it would have to be something like um, something like a neurological event, an event or structure in your brain, or maybe in your nervous system. It would consist in a lot of uh, neurons connected together with interactions among them, rates of fire in one part responding to rates of fire in another part. Um, that's what a belief would have to be, right? In fact, if I had a blackboard and chalk, I would draw you a belief, you know, just be a bunch of neurons and so on. That would be the belief that all men are mortal. Okay. Um, well, now, instead of thinking about ourselves in thinking about this premise one, think about a population of creatures on some distant planet, perhaps in one of those other universes people talk about nowadays, the multiverse, and suppose that N and E holds for them. What we can assume about these creatures is that their behavior is adaptive, right? They have come to be by virtue of evolution, so their behavior is adaptive. It's conducive to survival and reproduction. This behavior is caused by processes in their brains. So we ordinarily think that uh, uh, if I raise my arm, that'll be a result of some process in my nervous system maybe a signal being sent from my brain down and uh, down certain efferent nerves to the appropriate muscles, which then contract and up goes my arm, okay? So we can assume these creatures, their behavior is adaptive. It's conducive to survival and reproduction. This behavior is caused by processes in their brains or nervous systems. We call that, we can call that the underlying neurology. That neurology, therefore, is also adaptive, since it causes adaptive behavior. We can say that it too is adaptive, all right? This neurology furthermore also causes their beliefs. But so far as that adaptive behavior is concerned, it doesn't matter whether those beliefs 
caused by the underlying neurology are true or false. Could be true, that's fine. If false, that's also fine, as long as the underlying neurology causes the right kind of actions. So uh, Patricia Churchland, some places, says, truth, whatever that is, definitely takes the hindmost. Okay? Truth doesn't matter here. What matters is adaptive action. So it doesn't matter whether their beliefs are mostly true or mostly false or whatever. Take any particular belief, what's the probability that it is true? Any particular belief selected at random, you might say. Well, it might be true, could be true, given an enemy, but could also be false. It's as likely to be false as to be true, so the probability of that belief, uh, so the probability of that belief being true, we'd have to say was approximately a half. But if that's the case, the probability of R for these creatures will be very low. If you have something like a hundred independent beliefs, that is, beliefs that are independent of each other, um, and the probability with respect to each that is true is a half, then the probability that, say, two-thirds of those beliefs are true, which would be a rather a low threshold for reliability, that'll be uh, very small, maybe one out of a million, something like that, all right? Okay, so the probability of R for these creatures is really low. The probability of R uh, on N and E for them will be low. And if low for them, <coughs> the same would be true for us, if N and E are true for us. Okay, um, now I'd like to repeat the argument for one, but in a slightly different fashion. So, um, if you take a belief, a belief will be a neurological structure, a bunch of neurons, and so on. Um, this belief will have to have two quite different properties. On the one hand, it'll have neurophysiological properties, properties that detail how many neurons there are in that belief, and how they're related to each other, and how the rate of fire in one part of this event uh, or structure influences the rate of fire in other parts. Neurophysiological properties. Um, but it will also have to have, if it's a belief, it will have to be the belief that P for some proposition P, perhaps the proposition that naturalism is all the rage these days, or that all men are mortal. So it will also have to have a content. It will have to have a content property, the property of being the belief that P for some particular proposition P. It will have as content some proposition. Okay. Now, um, thinking about it from this point of view, we're thinking about this thing all, all along here from the point of view of N and E, which includes materialism. Thinking about it from this point of view, um, it's certainly true that beliefs can cause actions. Beliefs can cause actions, as I was saying a bit ago, maybe a belief, maybe there's a belief, um, maybe I believe there's a beer in the refrigerator and I want a beer, so this belief can cause me, along with that desire, to go to the refrigerator and get the beer. So beliefs can cause actions, but they can only cause actions by virtue of their neurophysiological properties, not by virtue of the content. It'll be by virtue of the neurological, neurophysiological properties of the belief, what sorts of signals it's sending at what times to, uh, to what nerves and muscles. It's by virtue of those properties that it causes what it does, not by virtue of its content. If it's um, got the right neurological process, if it's got the right neurological, neurophysiological properties, um, and that uh, that caused uh, caused me to go to the refrigerator, then even if the content had been something totally different, had it still had those physiological neuro neurophysiological properties, those NP properties, it would have caused the same result with respect to behavior, all right? And that means that um, evolution can't really get a look at the content of beliefs. Evolution can modify belief-producing processes in the direction of, uh, of greater adaptivity so that they cause the right kind, so that they cause the beliefs that cause the right kind of actions. But it won't be able in doing this to get a look at the uh, 
at the content because the content doesn't enter the causal chain that leads to behavior. And if that's the case, um, then the fact that we wound up with a belief or that these creatures were thinking about these creatures on some other planet, that they wound up with a particular um, belief producing processes that they have and the particular beliefs that they have, that gives no reason whatever for thinking that the content of these beliefs is true or more likely to be true than not or anything of the sort. So once again we arrive at the result that the probability of R on N and E with respect to these creatures is very low. So what I've been arguing here then is not that naturalism and evolution, that conjunction is false, but that it's not possible to um, that not possible to accept them rationally together. You can't <laughs> rationally accept their conjunction. One or the other, maybe, uh, but not not the uh, conjunction. Okay? Now, um, so we've got the first premise, the probability of R on N and E is low. Um, here's a kind of objection someone might raise that I'd like to briefly address. Um, I say the probability of R on N and E is low, but presumably the naturalist believes other things besides N and E, right? So uh, what about these other things? Maybe the probability of R on N and E is low, but the probability of R on N and E and X, X or something else that the naturalist believes, maybe that's not low, all right? What sort of things could be put properly put in for X? Um, well, not presumably that, not R itself, no doubt the naturalist does believe that R is true, that his cognitive faculties are reliable, um, but obviously you can't, quite, you can't properly put that into the, into the condition of the argument and argue that the probability of R on N and E and R is low. It is, of course, uh, is, is not low, is high. It is, of course, high. It's a probability of one, um, but if that were a proper procedure, you could never have any arguments of this sort at all. You couldn't get any inductive arguments of this sort at all. So presumably nothing that, um, uh, not R or anything that directly implies R, like R and two plus one equals three, or R and all men are mortal, and so on. Nothing like that can go into R. Uh, what sort of thing could go into R? Um, well, here's one suggestion. Um, you could say something like this. You could say um, a content property really is nothing else than a conjunction of a certain set of neurophysiological properties, NP properties. So for a belief to have the property of having as content um, 7 plus 5 equals 12, that's just for it to have a certain set of neurophysiological properties. Content properties themselves just are um, neurological properties or conjunctions of neurological properties. Neuro, neurophysiological properties, all right? And if that were true, um, then contrary to what I said, it would not be the case that a belief, um, I, said it was, it, I said it was not the case that a belief causes what it does by virtue of its, of its content, but if content, just, if content properties just were NP properties, then that would, what I said would be false, and that would be very bad. So, uh, so what can we say about that? Well, okay, so that would be then adding to N and E, adding something like R E, R M for reductive materialism, where reductive materialism is a thought that mental properties just are conjuries of uh, physical properties, all right? Well, then if you reflect about it, what you can see, I think, is that in that case, it is by virtue of, um, of content that a given belief causes what it does cause, but now it won't make the slightest difference whether that content is true or false with respect to the causation of a given, um, of a given um, adaptive action. It'll be by virtue of the content, but the content's just a certain set of properties, of neurophysiological properties, which themselves constitute a certain content, but it doesn't matter whether the content they constitute is true content or false content. Well, I think I'll stop there. So uh, there you have it. Right.
Do you want to coordinate the Q&A? Or? Sure, yeah. Okay, so we have uh, some time for questions, if that's okay with you. Yeah. If that's sure. okay with you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Can you define truth for us in the context of this lecture? Truth? Yeah, what's truth? I don't think you can define truth. I, I think we all know what it is, but I don't know. Well, there are varying theories of truth. If you have a pragmatic theory of truth, then the fact that truth, that this leads to adaptive functions, that's all we really need. Is that pragmatic? A pragmatic theory of truth, that truth is what works, sort of? Yeah. Yeah, but lots of times um, things that are incompatible with each other work. So, I mean, I can't see how truth could just be what works. Um, it might work. Um, if I want you to go downtown, it might work for me to tell you I would really like that you should go downtown because there's a wonderful movie playing at such and such a place. But it might also work to say um, you should go downtown because, well, there aren't any movies playing downtown. There's this wonderful exhibit in the museum. Both of those, on, on your view, apparently would be true, but they seem to be incompatible with each other. And I was taking it that at least one thing we know about truths is that no two truths are incompatible with each other. Yeah. <clears throat> Intuitively, it seems that this, uh, the, the premise and the argument for, for premise one it, it, it is challenging. Say, as far as that adaptive behavior is concerned, it doesn't matter whether those beliefs are true or false. That, that premise. Yeah. The, doesn't it seem likely that behavior that is uh, conducive to survivability or survival is less likely if the um, if the beliefs or if the if the stimulus for that behavior um, is something which is not um, if your if, if if sorry if behavior is a response to the to certain external stimuli and you have your cognitive faculties that allow you to perceive these those external stimuli and therefore thereby produce the proper reaction wouldn't that indicate wouldn't that uh, yeah I think it would I think you're right but. Um, but there may very well be such stimuli which aren't beliefs, right? So, for example, bacteria are said in the northern hemisphere always to move towards the deeper water, which is uh, anaerobic bacteria, which contains less oxygen and is therefore uh, better for them. So they've got uh, some kind of indicators that indicate where, which way to go here. Um, and uh, you can think of those indicators as accurate, if you like, uh, but presumably they don't have beliefs. They don't believe, well, there's less oxygen down there, so I'll go down there, right? So there are indicators on the one hand and uh, beliefs on the other. And the same goes for human beings. There are lots of indicators in our, in our bodies of various states of affairs where we don't have any beliefs at all. I mean, um, if you're blood temperature gets a little bit too high, maybe sweating occurs or other cooling phenomena. But this can happen without anybody in the neighborhood, either you or these phenomena or uh, your blood vessels, believing anything at all, right? So um, I guess it would, I guess you'd be right in saying they have to, and, and we could also think of these indicators as part of one's cognitive, um, cognitive, cognitive endowment. I don't know if you want to call them faculties or not, but cognitive endowment. Uh, right, but I don't think that has much to do so far with belief. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of evolution, I'm sure I can't quite hear you. Sorry. Um, in terms of the compatibility of evolution with belief, yeah. that's typically with God as opposed to with biblical interpretation. Are we saying that it's very, very, very nominal interpretation for how Genesis occurred, or are we saying that using micro and macro evolution? Uh, we're thinking about macro evolution, but, but now, well, what, I didn't catch the first part of what you said. Um, Say it loudly and slowly. Yeah, sorry. You're talking to a recalcitrant eight year old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I understand how we can understand the process of evolution, assuming it wasn't um, non guided, as working, as being compatible with theistic beliefs. Right. But there's a lot of contradictions with biblical interpretation of creation in that sense. And there are lots of different theories about creation or about what the Bible says about yeah. creation. So are we taking it that we just, the Bible is just not a textbook, a science textbook at all, so we can't understand that all in literal, in literal interpretation? Or are we saying that there's some aspects of evolution that occur, other aspects that haven't been proven yet, so 
so we'll do it from that from a micro point of view, but not a macro. I'm just trying to uh, well, um, I don't want to take a position on whether the Bible should ever be taken as a scientific textbook. I mean, when people say that, I think what they mean when they say it shouldn't be, I think what they mean is, is correct. But maybe there are some things in the Bible that uh, if you take seriously, you take the Bible seriously, do tell you something of, something of broadly speaking, scientific sort. Um, what I was thinking here, though, is that if you look at the first chapters of Genesis, the early chapters of Genesis, they don't have the same kind of feel that the later chapters of Genesis, accounting where Abraham went and his sons and like. Uh, they, they seem to be of a different sort. They seem much more like a kind of a mythological account, where I don't mean mythological meaning false, but uh, sort of a poetic account, something like that. And a poetic account to tell you something important, but not such that you should uh, take the details of the account as literally true. That's the way I would say it. So assuming what I think the professor calls reductive materialism. I'm sorry? Assuming what I think the professor calls reductive materialism, that a belief is just a collection yeah. of stimuli. Yeah. So then well, not a collection. A belief would be a collection of neurophysiological properties. Right. I'm sorry. The content of a belief would be that. Yeah. Right. So, so assume, assuming that, wouldn't a true belief be more conducive to survival? Well, that's what I can't see. I mean, so it's a collection of neurophysiological properties, right? That collection of neurophysiological properties also causes something, maybe a cause of something adaptive. But um, why would it matter whether the neurophysiological properties, by virtue of which a belief causes something adaptive to happen, why would it matter whether, whether um, that what the content of that, or the proposition, the content that that collection embodied was true or not? It wouldn't make any difference as far as I can see. Why would it matter? So you've got this bunch of neurophysiological properties. They cause an adaptive action by walking around, by running away, and there's a lion present, something like that. Not that that would be too much good, since lions can run about 35 miles an hour, and I'd be lucky to hit 10 miles an hour. But anyway, uh, so there's so there's this um, this belief causes that behavior, and a certain set of the neurophysiological properties of that belief also constitutes a certain content. But why does it matter what content? I mean, it's not by virtue of, it's not by virtue of the truth of the content that what happens, happens. Uh, but the truth of the content, one way or another, is really irrelevant. Um, I, I was wondering two things about premise one. One uh, thing related to what you asked a moment ago. Um, suppose that a belief we take seriously is something I'm naturally not inclined to, but that a belief having a certain content just is a sort of physical fact about that physical thing that is the belief. So that um, the uh, having the content of uh, being the belief that revealing oneself to a lion in the bush is good just is this physical structure, and having the content of being the belief that revealing to oneself to a lion in the bush is not good is this other physical structure. Why can't, why can't then the fact that the first is adaptive depend on the fact that it's true? Well, it could. I'm not saying it couldn't happen, that adaptive content, <coughs> that um, uh, the content that goes with adaptive behavior should be true, could happen. Could just as well be false, though. So I've got this, um, this belief causes me to run, run off by virtue of these neurophysiological properties. They also constitute a certain proposition or a relation to a certain proposition, but it doesn't matter whether that's true or false. Well, the reason why the first is adaptive is because it's true that uh, revealing yourself to a lion in the bush is not good. That's, uh, that's, that's, so that's why that's adaptive. Adapt because it's true? Um, no, it's not, it's not adaptive because it's true. It's, it, happens to, it happens to constitute a true content. But if instead it constituted the content that um, lions are large, friendly pussycats and it's uh, a good idea to go and run up to them and pet them, that would be just as good. But maybe it's physically impossible to 
for it to have a different content. Maybe it is. The content just is physical structure. Yeah, maybe it is, uh, but it still doesn't matter whether the content that is actually constituted is true or not. But if it weren't true, it wouldn't be adapted. In this particular case, but it doesn't, but it, there's no reason to uh, to think that it has to be adaptive. It just happens in this particular case that the content um, is adaptive and the content also constitutes true belief. But there's no reason to think that that happens generally. It could happen, but it might also not happen. So maybe content is always fixed as a certain physical thing, and so the ones in general that are adaptive are the ones that are true. That's but the part I don't see. Eat, things being good to avoid. That, that's the part I don't see. I mean, uh, presumably content is fixed by neurophysiological properties if, in fact, neurophysiological, if, in fact, content just is a conjuries of neurophysiological properties. But from that, nothing at all follows about whether um, adaptive behavior has, uh, is caused by true content. It could just well be caused by false content. May I ask one other rather truly question about premise one? Do you yourself think, right, that the unconditional probability of R is high, or at least not low? Uh, yeah. Uh, now, suppose Dawkins says to you, I agree with you, and he then further says, I assign Bayesian probability of 1 to N and E. Then why would he accept the first premise? If he uh, says the probability of... N and E is Bayesian probability of 1. Um, what do you mean Bayesian Well, probability? I mean he assigns Bayesian certainty to N and E. Then the probability of argument so he's certain. Of R. He's certain of N and E, and um, he also accepts R. And you said R is high. And I say R is high. So but I say he's got to think it. He thinks it's low. Is what I'm what I'm saying. If I'm not, if maybe I'm not understanding you. Well, <clears> if he assigns Bayesian certainty to N and E, then the conditional probability of argument N and E is just the probability of R, which you've said is high. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I don't know what to say about that. He wouldn't, in fact, think the probability of N and E is, is 1, presumably. He may be ensconced in his background information. He would think it'd be, ability. yeah, he would think it's high. I mean, he says it's something like uh, 9 out of 10 or something like that for atheism. So for naturalism and evolution, it couldn't be 1. Um, well, could he escape you if he did a science term? If he did assign it one, well, I don't know. I mean, um, I'm not sure what the right answer to that is. If he assigns that one and he thinks the unconditional probability of R, the unconditional probability, um, I guess the right thing to say there is that you don't have any view about what the unconditional probability of R is. I believe R, but I don't know if that's a matter of how that translates into its uh, unconditional probability. I think it's high, but I don't know that that's. Um, I don't know if that's thinking of it as an unconditioned probability. It's just something. It's something I believe. That much is true. But I. I wouldn't know what. I wouldn't know what to. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think that that. Uh, it's a matter of its being um, unconditioned probability. I'm not. I mean that idea. That idea is sort of like there are all these propositions, that, uh, propositions in the universe, and they get assigned various probabilities, just as such, um, some high and some low. Well, I shouldn't think that R would be particularly high along the, along those lines. So it's not the case that whatever I think is true is also such that I think it's that its unconditioned probability is high. So you don't think the probability of R. I think R is true, but I don't think it's probability just as such on no evidence. I don't have any view about what that is. So Darwin eventually lost his faith, but it wasn't his development of his theories that caused him to lose his faith. He found his faith uh, compatible for quite a few years with the theories that he was developing. And I think that it's fair to say from the notebooks and evidence that we have that his thinking went along the following lines, which was that God could have caused uh, the world to work in that way in line with his theories and wouldn't really necessarily call, call into question uh, the, the existence of God, the nature of God, or whatever. So 
my question is, you, you had a similar argument as part of your, of your talk. My question is, wouldn't that always be true? That is, if, if a scientific theory holds that uh, something works this way or that way in the world, that any scientific theory could add God onto it, and it wouldn't necessarily be incompatible. That is, you could generalize your argument, and, and, and what I'm saying is true of Darwin, mm -hmm. to really any scientific theory whatsoever. Um, you think that's Even true? Even later changes, but, I, but I, I'm taking it that that could be, that could be generalizable. Right. Um, uh, do, you think, do you think that's true? Uh, that, that I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm not uh, too good at navigating these waters, but I'm, I'm uh, pretty well signed on with Stephen Jay Gould that you have two magisteria, right, and yeah. that we're in one or the other. And so, but, but I, I, it, I find it fairly convincing. That is, it seemed to me that Darwin lost his belief for emotional and fam reasons of emotion and family mm -hmm. tragedy not because his logic changed or his right, belief changed. Yeah. There was no reason for him to change the way he was thinking. Yeah, but I, right. Uh, but I'm thinking about the other part, the suggestion that no matter what science came up with, you could always just add God to it. Um, I mean, if you thought about, I mean, there are lots of things you think science would never come up with. For example, that there aren't any people. Science presumably would never come up with that. But if it did come up with that, you couldn't, really, you couldn't add um, God onto that and have a theory that's well, there, there have been scientific theories that have been either uh, dated or outmoded or built upon or for some reason rejected or generalized at a higher level that this would still apply to, like Newtonian mechanics. Sure. Is not as true as later theories of physics, but yet you add God onto Newtonian mechanics, which many people did. There's not a problem with that. No, I think that's right. So, so. Um, but my only question is about whether it's true as you were to say that no matter what science came up with, you could always just add the existence of God onto it. Um, I'm not sure that that's true. We'd have to try to think about lots of examples. I'm not sure that that's true. Uh, for how much longer uh, you want to go now? Um, well, a little okay. while longer. Two? Okay. All right. Maybe one more question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question on number two. It says that um, Mara has a freedom. Right. Um, isn't the, the premise number one just saying that the probability of arguing she was low, but not that it completely defeats it? And therefore, if there were other reasons to believe Mara is true, even though it's very unlikely to be true, there may be, it may still be true even given that. Right, um, but you get a um, you get a defeater for R, or you get say imagine with respect to your thermometer. Um, suppose you uh, suppose um, you get a, you have a reason for thinking it's not reliable. You have a defeater for thinking it's reliable. Um, so I say if, if you accept entity and the probability of R on entity is low, then you have a defeater for R. Is your suggestion as well? Maybe you'd believe other things besides N and E, such that uh, the fact is the probability of R on N and E maybe is low, but not our probability of R on N and E and X for this other thing X is not low. Is that your thought? Right, in conjunction with the idea that yeah. the first premise doesn't completely defeat R, it just makes it low probability. Right. Well, that's what I was addressing at the very end, you know, when I said consider the probability of R on N and E and X for various possible Xs. And what I really, and the conclusion there is, well, I can't think of an X that works for the naturalist. Um, and the various Xs that you could consider, for example, reductive materialism, don't in fact work. But of course, it doesn't follow that there isn't any such X. So my guess, so I think the thing, to, the thing that I think about the first premise is, um, it's probably true. Even though you said before, Professor Johnson, that the unconditional probability no, I didn't say that. I said I don't know what the unconditional probability of R is. When you think about conditional versus unconditional probability, when you think about the unconditional part, there the idea is you've got this vast field of propositions, and they all just have a probability attached to them. 
just as such. So what's the probability just as such that our cognitive, human cognitive faculties are reliable? Uh, I have no idea what that would be, but I can't, but I, uh, I mean, I just wouldn't know. How would you know what that was? What's, what's, the pro, what's the unconditional probability that there are horses? I don't know. So, so I'm not saying that the unconditional probability of R is high. I, I don't know what it is. Just to follow up on the previous question about adding God, uh, if the universe began with a big bang, God made the big bang. Or if the universe rests on a bunch of turtles, God created the turtles and put the universe on the turtles. So uh, cannot all theories uh, about reality be traced back to God? Well, I don't know. I mean, suppose science comes up with the idea that the universe has always existed. There never, it has existed for an infinite stretch of time. Far back as you can go, it was there. Um, it has just always existed. I think that might be incompatible, not just with the existence of God as such, I guess, but with a, uh, with a Jewish Christian belief that God created the world at some time. One more question, yeah. So just to, just to make sure I understand this correctly, is this basically, what you're basically arguing then is that something similar to what's been argued by, I think, since the time of Descartes, that the only reason we have confidence, or the only compelling reason to have confidence that our rational beliefs that we hold are true is because God created us in, in, the, way that, in the way that we should be confident that God could But if we just think that all acts of nature are random, there's no reason to believe, there's, no, there's very hard to find compelling evidence that we should, that we should think that, our argument, that, that what we think is correct. So it's, it's, it's a rehashing of that same argument. I'm not saying that it's a direct argument for that reason, but it sort of stems exactly from that argument. Uh -huh. Well, uh, not exactly. I mean, I, I, um, if the suggestion is that we can't come up with a good argument for our faculties being reliable, I have to say that seems right, because any such argument would, of course, employ our cognitive faculties, and to rely on the argument would presuppose that our faculties are reliable. So Thomas Reed makes this point. You can't, in this way, um, give a good argument for or prove or something like that that your cognitive faculties are reliable. On the other hand, it, um, why do people think their faculties are reliable? Uh, it's just the way we're constructed. We ordinarily all assume from the time we're very small that our cognitive faculties are reliable, that if it looks like there is a tricycle there, you know, if it, um, well, there probably is a tricycle there, right? We, we make this assumption and do so quite properly, perfectly rational to do that. And I don't think that for it to be sensible or rational for you to do that, you have to believe that there is such a person as God. It might be that one could give some argument for that conclusion, um, but that would be a different point. It wouldn't be that you would not be justified or reasonable in holding that belief until you knew that argument. So, um, I don't know, atheistic eight-year-olds who trust their cognitive faculties, as far as I know, they're perfectly rational. Thank you very much.